And so today, this is our agenda. We're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about the financial aid experience that our students encounter, the importance of the last date of attendance, um, why students say that they owe back financial aid, the impact of these grades on the student's financial aid award, um, financial aid academic requirements, not specifically Valencia academic requirements, because those are two completely different things, and financial aid is the umbrella. And sometimes when students receive multiple awards, some of those awards, especially scholarships, have different academic requirements. So today we're going to touch on the federal academic requirements to receive financial aid. And then we're going to close out our presentation with um, uh, the business office feature of why students get dropped for non-payment. So that's going to start us off with the student experience. Yes. So before we go on, we want to give you a little overview of what a student goes through when they say, I'm applying for financial aid, I am waiting on my financial aid to get to me. So the first thing they need to do is apply for FAFSA. And so once they do that, it takes three to five business days before it gets to the college. After that, the student is responsible for tracking their Atlas account, which they create at the beginning of their admissions process. The student will see the outstanding requirements, which we would post in their account, and then we would say in there what are the missing documents that they need to submit to our offices. Once the student submits those documents, then in order to submit the documents, they first need to obtain them from different entities. The students do not always have these papers at home. So sometimes that the student's process can get delayed because they have to order from the IRS some of this paperwork. Um, and then they make submissions to the college. Once we receive those, we process the accounts. Um, if the student is selected for verification, we verify the accounts, and then the information is sent to the Department of Education. Once all the corrections are accepted, then we can go ahead and award the accounts. After um, we award the accounts, the students have to accept those awards, and they have the option to decline loans or to accept loans. At our institution, the Pell Grant is automatically accepted. Um, then the aid is authorized once the student has accepted, um, but the students have to be enrolled in classes before those funds can go out and pay out. Um, once the pay and the refund time comes, if the student had leftover aid, we issue a refund to their account. If not, then the tuition only will be covered. The importance of us laying this out for you is so that you understand that a student that needs and depends on financial aid to pay for um, their classes, it's not an easy process. It's yes. not a, I just submit a free application, my award comes in and pays for my classes. Um, and it's extremely difficult for first-time generation students when they don't kind of have that, you know, uh, support or that information coming in the front end. They really depend on that first experience coming into the college and the advisors and our enrollment staff um, really explaining that and guiding the student through the process. Um, so that was very important for us to show you, you know, by the time the student is in your classroom, they have gone through a lot of processes um, before mm -hmm. they're even able to sit in that classroom. And it doesn't just end by the time they sit in that classroom. And so um, the uh, AVP, Daniel Bar Barkovitz, talked a little bit today about a survey that the office conducted on students. Um, and so today we want to present to you the data that was collected during that survey regarding their financial um, experience here at the institution. I think that because of the internet issues that we were having, the video won't be able to load, but most of the information that you needed to know, Daniel went over in the previous presentation. If you guys would like a copy of the survey, our trailer survey, we are more than glad to email that to you, so just let us know at the end of the presentation. Do you want to highlight some key, key parts from the... Sure. About 63% of our students um, said that they had a worry about having enough money to pay for school. 63% of our students is more than half. So if you're not sure that you can pay for your tuition, that means you're not sure you can pay for your books. That means you're not sure you can get the materials to complete your class. So when a student comes to you and tells you, hey, I wasn't able to submit my first assignment because I didn't have a computer to do it, they might actually not be lying to you. They might actually be sharing with you that they actually are facing financial difficulties and that you need to redirect them to resources. We passed around a resource sheet um, for you to take a look at whenever you have time and to kind of guide you as faculty as to what are the departments and resources that we have available in our offices um, for our students. Um, we also have in this survey that 31% of our students, our Valencia students, face very low food security. Very low. 
as Daniel was saying, that means you don't know where your next meal is coming from. So with that, we want to bring to light our Pookie's Pantry. For those that may not be aware that we have this resource, students only, all they have to do is go to our student development offices and say that they have a need. They don't have to go into depth of explanations. They just have to go um, and they will guide them through the process and they will provide them with a certain amount of items per day. A student can go every single day and grab a meal and, gra and grab a bag of food from them. There's no limit. All they need to have is a Valencia ID. I don't think most people know our counselors also have the vouchers that they can be used in the cafeteria. Yes. Yes. Usually those are um, the homeless students become aware of those because they're taken through that process. But always refer a student to our offices if they mention any kind of need. Um, and we're going to go a little bit into what last date of attendance is. At Valencia, we are not, we are not an attendance taking institution. Because if we were, that means that as faculty, you guys would have to take attendance every single day. So we're required to, um, of course, monitor and report the last date of attendance for no-show, uh, before the no-show period. Um, we need to make sure that we're recording a student's, of course, daily, you know, a daily attendance of the class. And, and then th this is important in order to document and calculate, um, unearned aid of a student. So, um, when you receive emails from the financial aid office requesting that you report this information by a specific date, that's critical and would impact um, the amount of aid the student is eligible to uh, keep and or have to return. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we share that information with you today. And um, do you want to um, before we go on with this, I just wanted to highlight that you guys have a last date of attendance worksheet that was also passed around. That's what I was looking for to show you. Um, if you have any questions in regards to last date of attendance, when you have some time, you can take a look. It just kind of guides you as faculty in the importance of this matter and what you need to do. I have a question about the last day of attendance. So the calculating the, the aid earned, is that just the Pell Grant aid or the loan as well? It's so, the entire federal student aid okay. award. So they got Pell Grant. Yep. Grant Every, and, and, and it's done in a specific order um, on what will be required to be paid back, depending on the formula and the calculation. Um, but that last date of attendance is put into a formula and determines in the end, the impact that the student has. And of course, the information that we share today is not for you to change the policy that you follow with taking your attendance, but just to understand um, the impact of that date on a student. Yes. One thing which makes it hard for me, I teach some online classes, and if a student withdraws themselves, literally they disappear from my online class, and I can't even see the last time they've actually interactive with the class, so it kind of makes it difficult. Yeah, I would recommend that you um, speak with your deans on the campus to come up with a way to be able and a policy for you to track um, the last date of attendance for online courses. We definitely, in the financial aid office, don't want to, um, you know, state something that, you know, on behalf of your, your um, department. So oftentimes it's the last access date of the student online. Mm -hmm. So if a student has accessed it in Canvas, you can go in and see like the last date they accessed the course, and that's usually some deans go by that date. But they disappear from my my course as soon as they withdraw. Yeah, I, like I can't see the last access date. Oh. Well, I'm sure that um, with speaking with other professors that have done online classes or possibly with your dean and maybe highlighting this workshop and letting them know like, hey, I went to this workshop and they talked about the impact of the last date of attendance. What should we do to support our online students when the technology does not allow us to track this information efficiently? Okay. Yeah, I understand. I understand. So at the end of the term, the financial aid office is going to review students' um, grades, specifically these grades, um, and they're going to reach out to professors asking for um, 
to be provided the last date of attendance. And in that email, they're going to indicate by which date um, they need that information to be input into the system. Students who are confirmed to have ceased attending prior to completing 60% of the term must be processed for a return of unearned aid. Typically, that date falls within the withdrawal deadline. Um, so if a student ends up with any of these grades before then, we would um, want to definitely make sure that we're um, re receiving that last date of attendance. If we're not able to obtain these dates um, by, a, by the specific date or at all, then um, the student is not entitled to any federal dollars. So um, student questions on withdrawals or grades should uh, first filter through the answer center. Um, and of course, we want to make sure that um, the answer center would then be able to address their concerns. And if not, then they're ret referred to a financial aid specialist. Daniel? Can I put that in a little nuance? I, if you don't mind, of that. course. So um, one of the issues is we, we are not an attendance taking institution. I just want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. Because if we are, then all of you must take attendance all the time. Mm -hmm. What we say, and this is really, this is a, a distinction that makes a difference, because if we say to the Department of Education, we're an attendance-taking institution, then every class, every time, every day. What we are is an institution that says, we measure attendance as required for the start of the period, for no-show, to make sure we document a student is attending, and where available, we rely on faculty to tell us the last date of in-person attendance for in-person classes, or the last day of academic-related activity for online classes. I found out where it was. Okay. It's in people, yeah. and Great. it shows an active, Good. but I didn't know that. Okay. But again, it's, it's the, that academic-related activity. So I just we need to be careful around our language. What we don't want to put out there is that, so again, we say we highly recommend that you take attendance, so mm -hmm. you can document the last day of attendance, but I never want to be in a position of saying, to any outside entity that we mandate attendance. Because if we mandate attendance taking, then y'all better be taking attendance every day. And I know some of us don't. So that's just, again, just to be clear, Good. because then, then we have a very different level of requirement that we have to follow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so with the last date of attendance, we kind of talked about this a little bit. Um, do you want to highlight some features here? Very important to know that, for example, when a student has an I grade, we do something that we call SAT status, student academic standing, right? And so, a student academic progress. And so we have to measure that standing. When you have an I grade for the semester, we cannot measure what was the progress for the semester because we're missing information. And so until that information is clarified in the system, the student cannot get aid for the next semester. So that is why it's important, and that is why we send out communication to try to get these dates from you, because it kind of stops the student. Not only does it affect the aid that they have received, but it affects future aid. So that is very important to keep in mind. Students receiving financial aid who withdraw or stop attending will, in most cases, be required to return a portion of financial aid received. Once the return of Title IV aid is calculated, the student receives an email and they receive communication as to how much they have earned of the aid that was released to them and how much of that aid they need to return. If the student fails to return those funds to the college, then the student cannot receive further aid because now the student has a balance to the institution. If that balance is not paid to the institution, then eventually it gets referred to the Department of Education and then they have to communicate with them. And, and so um, this is when you hear students say, I have to pay back my financial aid. I owe my financial aid. Um, in our office, we call it, you know, either the return of Title IV aid. Um, in some instances, it could be an overpayment. Um, so we just, you know, th these are situations that the student encounters when they, you know, end up with certain grades at the end of the term or stop attending. So the financial aid office also has, yeah. No, you're fine. But so you said, so if a student stops attending after you've given them their refund, mm -hmm. and they withdraw or they have an LDA in the system, they're going to have to pay back that refund. Um, yes, and it's it's all timing. It's all timing. So the last date of attendance 
is put into a formula and then based off of that calculation from that formula, it is determined. So it's not a blanket statement. Um, many factors need to be considered um, before we can um, officially state. So the question would be, did the student withdraw from all of their classes? Um, did the student withdraw the day after we paid? So there's multiple factors that are considered um, when we determine how much a student needs to pay. Because I, I noticed after students get their money mm -hmm. refunded, I have a lot of all of a sudden not showing the class. Oh, I send the email wow. out going, so you haven't been in class, is everything okay? Oh, good, I'll be returning to the class. Okay, good. Then I see them back in class, and then mm -hmm. there's some I don't see at all. So okay. I don't want to. Most likely, um, the students that encounter a uh, return of Title IV aid letter, uh, some I'm not sure exactly, um, they're, they're probably going to end up knocking on your door and saying, hey, you know, financial aid just said that because of that, can I get back into your class? Um, because they withdrew at a certain period and now they're being told and they went to the answer center and the answer center is telling them, hey, you may have to pay that money back. And then they try to get back into the class. Um, so, of course, you know... Well, that's one, and we're going to touch a little bit um, on the other reason why that could happen. Yeah. So um, the financial aid office has uh, academic requirements that a student, minimum academic requirements that a student is expected um, to make at the e end of every term, um, and at the when we evaluate their academic progress. And uh, those requirements are that they complete 67% of the attempted classes. So just to give you an example of what that looks like, um, if a student enrolls in four classes, we would want them to complete three, so they remain above the 67. If they only complete two, they're at 50 and they drop below. Um, we definitely want to make sure that they maintain a Valencia GPA of 2.0, but also an overall GPA. So what that means is that we're looking at what they're doing here at Valencia. We're looking at what they transferred in and what they did at Valencia. And then we want to make sure that they graduate before meeting, reaching 150% of the classes that they would need to complete that degree. And we're going to try to roll quick because our time is uh, going and we'll answer questions right after. Um, so if the student doesn't meet just one of those requirements, um, they have an option of appealing to our office. And there's a formal document that they submit. They, there's, you know, requirements and um, things that we want them to submit with that appeal form. When they submit that appeal form, a financial aid committee reviews it and determines if the reasons why they did not meet though at least one of those requirements are is valid. Then we uh, would approve the student for financial aid, and they may be placed on a plan. And sometime, what does that plan look like? That, that plan may require that they not change their major. It may require them not to fail or withdraw from classes. Um, it may, and then, and not take classes that are outside of their major. So as long as the student continues on the plan that we, um, inform them of, they will continue to receive financial aid until they graduate. If the, there comes the, wait, 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 don't take me out of your class. I can't be withdrawn from your class. Yes. Don't, don't drug me out. That's why. Because probably they're on an appeal plan and they have to abide by the rule. If not, they'll be suspended and possibly not be able to appeal for the next semester. So if the appeal is denied, we do provide the student with some options. They can enter into a payment plan. They can look into possible scholarships that would award them, depending on what type of academic requirement they're not meeting, or they could pay out of pocket. Once they meet the academic requirements established, um, then they would regain financial aid eligibility. So if they were suspended, doesn't necessarily mean that this is a forever deal, of course, unless it's a 150% rule then we definitely want them to make sure that they follow um, that appeal plan. And then some of our students get dropped for non-payment. And so the question is, why do our students get dropped for non-payment? So a student can be dropped because either they didn't have enough financial aid authorized. So you could have aid, but not enough to, come to pay your full tuition. Um, you did not have financial aid authorized at all because you have not completed the process. 
um, or you did not have financial aid and did not pay for classes because a student can simply not apply for financial aid and decide to go out of pocket or can apply for financial aid and only get loans and decline those loans. And at that point, the responsibility for payment is on the, stu on the student. Now, regardless of why the student was dropped, um, there are rules as to how can we get them back into those classes. So students are first dropped for non-payment by the fee payment deadline, right? After that, the system is scheduled to automatically drop the student from classes weekly. So for this information, we actually spoke to our business office to understand how is it that they do this process, because this is not done by our financial aid offices. Though it seems that it is closely connected, we have nothing to do with this process. Mm -hmm. Did and um, just mm -hmm. just to add into that, um, sometimes a student is awarded financial aid and they get this award and they don't understand what the award means or that that award may be split in half. And when that award is split, it, the Pell Grant truly doesn't cover the cost of their entire tuition. Um, but all they saw was that email and they mm -hmm. may have not understood the language in that email. Um, and then they get dropped from non-payment. So that's another reason. Or in rare, rare occasions, a hold can pop up out of nowhere on the student's account, yeah. um, which pulls back the aid that the student had. And then the student gets dropped. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it, every student situation is... Um, you know, specific to their story. And we just want to make sure that they're being referred to the correct department when that happens. And so they would initially go again to the answer center um, at your campus. The answer center would triage and see what was the issue and reach out to the specific department, depending on which department created the aid from being pulled back and then hopefully award. And then that's where your role as faculty um, come in where it's your choice to permit that student back into your classroom. Yes, so when it comes to re-enrolling a student into classes, the business office is unable to re-enroll students in drop classes before the drop ad period has ended. They cannot put the student back before then. The academic departments may re-enroll the students at their discretion. So that student that emailed you and told you, hey, I had an issue with my financial aid. I got dropped from your class. Can I go back in? If they go to the business office before the drop period is over, they're, they're going to tell them we can't help you. So the deans would be the ones um, that can help them out. Now, after classes start, the business office can place them back into classes if the academic department approves it, so they will contact your dean if immediate payment is made and the classes are not full. So the student would have to make payment for that class at that very moment, or the financial aid would have to be authorized at that very moment, and then the business office can do that. There should be no break in attendance by the student. So one of the things that the business office um, enforces is, has the student been attending your class for the last two weeks? Has the student been present? If a student has not been present and you do not want the student to be placed back in your roster, you can either put a comment on Space9, the S-P-A-C-N-T on banner, and say that you don't want the student back in there, or you can email the business office and they will keep that record so that if the student wants to go to them, they don't put them back. But they, they really ask that, you know, faculty takes pay close attention to this because they want to cooperate with you in whatever your process is. So that is, the student, that is the way that a student can get back. Now, before this period comes, the student either goes to the dean or they have to find a class that's available because they're still able to find a class because the drop period is still open. Questions, right on time. Just a little confusion. So when students are dropped out of our class, what more, make sure you guys agree the same thing, what we hear from our dean is you can't have a student in class who is not on your roster, mm -hmm. but then they're going to be missing classes, and you're saying they can't be having any gaps in attendance. So we've got a little... So that's when the business office, and again, this looks a little different depending on which campus you're attending and how the business office operates and how the deans operate, um, but... It, and again, it's working with the members that can make this happen for the student, um, with the specific departments that can make this happen. So if you're willing to allow the student back into your class, even with one date not being attended, then it's really your call. And, it, and if the financial aid is going to cover the classes, usually what the business office will say, hey, the student, the 
faculty members saying they missed two days, they still okay with the student coming in, for example. Um, does the amount of financial aid that would be authorized cover the classes? Yes, okay, let's get the student back. Um, so it's really just working with these key um, departments, which would be academic, business, financial aid, to get the student back to where they're intending on being. Yeah. Also, that, that can apply a lot to the student that was already in your class and all of a sudden disappeared. Yeah. So they go back to you and they've been attending and they say, hey, and you tell them, hey, you're not in my roster anymore. And they tell you, I don't know what happened. So in that process, a week might go by before that student can get everything together and their financial aid is fixed. Right. But that student needs for you to approve them being placed back in that class after the drop period. Okay. Got it? Which only lasts one week. Okay. So I have a, a few questions. Um, from the advising standpoint, one, you mentioned about the 67% by term. Um, during an advising session with a student, I'm not only just looking at their term, exactly I'm the overall. So mm -hmm. Um, with, in regards to what you were mentioning about that, it's not just for the term that they have to be at the 67% or higher. It's also their overall. Right? Yes, yes. So it's complete 67% of all classes attempted. Okay. Uh huh. Okay, it's just, from the first term. we automatically batch at the end of once grades post SAP. But if we have a transfer student that's coming in halfway through the semester, we're going to evaluate that SAP before we award. Um, but systematically, it's done at the end once grades post. Okay, so just to give you like a scenario of a recent student that I've had, the student um, is currently on a financial warning. Mm -hmm. This is their first semester that they came in under the 67% and also under um, a 2.0 GPA. Mm -hmm. So she wanted to know, would she be eligible for funding coming in the fall semester, but she's currently taking summer courses. So what I did was, is I told her what her current um, uh, completion ratio rate was, but then I also gave her of what it could potentially be with the current classes that she's enrolled in, which was like an additional nine credits. Mm -hmm. So I added those nine credits to the attempted, and I said, if you pass all of them, this is what your potential completion ratio could be, because mm -hmm. it hasn't been processed yet. But she and grades haven't posted. If she would be back in SAP met by fall to receive financial aid funding. So that's why I was asking in regards to the term, it's not just focused on the term, mm -hmm. but the overall. Correct, so the way that you calculate it is the way that I would for a student as okay. well. I would look at what they're currently enrolled if they say that they're gonna pass all classes and say, well, if you with your academic history, the adding of the completion of these classes, you're looking at this type of completion ratio. That's the only academic requirement that you're not meeting. You should be placed back into good standing once these grades are posted. Daniel, you want to highlight something? Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, so, no show. I just want to talk a little bit about no show. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would advise you all, and by virtue of that, advise our students, is not to rely on the on the fiscal drop, the drop piece you talked about for non-payment, to be a way to drop a class. Because often what you don't know is that we may have protected the student from drop. So what can happen is that the student will say, I just won't pay the bill and I'll be dropped from my classes. And then they'll wind up actually owing for those classes because we've protected them from drop because they have a financial aid issue, or it's their first time with a Sabbath meal, or they're a veteran. So you can, just a bit of advice, don't rely on that automated process to drop classes first year, number one. Um, number two, I think the other thing just to mention is, and again, I want to give credit uh, to those in the room, this SAP issue, we've really worked very hard mm -hmm. uh, under Melissa's leadership as well as some colleagues on the academic advising side on really trying to change the language around our SAP to more growth mindset focused approach. And I really am looking forward to seeing how this transpires for students. We're really trying to move from a language of penalizing to a language of welcome mm -hmm. and of students who have had difficulties before have been successful when they've done the following things. Exactly. And that warning creates a great opportunity to look at the academic, because lots of schools say, you're on warning. See you in the semester. But we're not saying that. We're saying, <laughs> you're on warning. Let us help you rehabilitate. Let us help you get back to mm -hmm. your best success. And if you stumble and you don't quite get to that 2.0 or that 67% cumulatively, we have, you'll be on suspension, but we have a probation process. Mm -hmm. We have an appeal process. Let us help you do that as well. So the more welcoming mm -hmm. message and approach we can take. Thank you. And to add to that, we have a 
That was a no, I was just say I found uh, also working with students that the, the, the spring to summer can be tricky and that they enroll in the summer courses yes. during spring when they're in SAP morning and on a week in between. They go into summer with the assumption I'm good to go for financial aid, grades are posted, SAP calculations are made, and now they're SAP suspended. And that's always a not the funnest. So we do have funding that's available. Um, depends on the situation. If the student has a compelling story, um, there are funds that could be made available. The other thing is we certainly will work with students around rehabilitating. I'm an academic advisor. The main thing that I see on my side of the are I and the girls that are quitters. They'll be told that the answer is going to be six credit hours. To at least get your money. So they just register for random six credit hours when they have to do six credit hours that go towards their degree. Compliant. So that is. Um, yeah, hard. and so what, what you're highlighting there is that financial aid in itself is a very complex process. And there's a lot of pieces that a student needs to understand in order to remain in good standing and continue to receive that award. Now, it's so complex that we have financial aid specialists and we have many financial aid specialists. And we're still, we, you know, with each other sometimes to understand a student's record because it can be difficult. And so what we're trying to highlight here is that it is a difficult concept. We're trying our best to communicate and um, do these types of workshops and change the language in which we communicate with students so that there's a better understanding of the process. Um, but again, as long as we're all understand how difficult this is, we can all work together to make that student experience a little bit better. Have also a SAP worksheet um, which is available online for our students. But now you also have a hard copy if you want to have that uh, when when you see a student. And this is supposed to help the student understand their account. And the whole idea is that let's say that your student is on warning and they don't need to appeal for the current semester. With this worksheet, the student can calculate and be able to tell beforehand, even if I ace all my classes. I'm still going to have to appeal for the next semester. So let me get mentally prepared and let me start gathering my documentation and let me get everything ready so that when the time comes, my application, my, my appeal is ready to submit. So make sure that if you can, you refer the students to this worksheet, you walk them through it so that they can understand their account. One thing that we do in our offices is that we actually, I manually calculate these things for them. And I guide them and I try to tell them, if you can't go full time in the semester, that's okay. This is how many semesters it's going to take you. This is how many credits you need. You can break it down however you want to break it down. But this is what you need to be able to get back in good standing. So that SAP worksheet is definitely going to help you. And these are some resources. We are way over our time and we see how interested the subject is and we hope to do more of these for you. Thank you for your time. If you have any questions, feel free to come up and approach us um, with those questions. Thank you.